You are listening to the Mark Guzman Podcast Experience. Okay, so now we're getting to the property analysis uh, portion of the show. And we have a fourplex in Richmond that we're going to analyze here. So, Brian, I'll let you take it from here. What property do we have? So, there's, this is a fourplex in Richmond. Again, we don't really drop addresses, but anytime you are curious about a property, feel free to reach out and uh, email us. This is a four-unit building in Richmond, and uh, it was built in 1951, older property. It actually qualifies not only for investor, not owner occupied financing, which is 25% down, but it also qualifies for an FHA 3.5% down. So for the... Um, for the sake of time, we're just going to go from the investor analysis standpoint of a 25% down. So here you have a property that's four units comprised of two bedroom, one bath with these existing current rents, not pro forma rents, mind you. And you'll see that the rents are all across the board. You'll see that they're at 1313, 2100, 1400, and 1494. Now, 2100 is a good indicator of what the fair market rent should be, right? And so when you start to break it down, and here's a, a picture of the fourplex, um, you'll, you'll notice that it's got different, um, uh, it's got a little deck. Uh, the exterior you'll see is a little older. Again, it's a 1951 building. And you always wanna make sure you get inspections for all of these things. But when you start to go through some of the interior shots, you'll see that it's a very well-maintained property with uh, new appliances, uh, nice finishings from wall, from floors to walls and kitchen. Um, just taking a couple of uh, quick shots of the kitchen here, and the great the quality of remodel along with the bathrooms. Right now, of course, let's jump into the spreadsheets, which um, I, I always like to go into. So the property, this fourplex, is asking seven hundred forty nine thousand dollars. When you take into consideration a 25% down plus closing cost and then the security deposit credits along with any city transfer tax, you're going to be in a position of having to buy the property for right about $206,034.50 out of pocket. Now, that all said, we're going to remember that number because it's going to be um, important when we're determining your ROI. So at $749,000, the first thing you're always going to hear me talk about is cap rate, cap rate, cap rate, because that's the very first denominator to determine if it's a good property or not. Now, the market cap enrichment is roughly between six and six and a half, meaning smart investors are buying a property and making at least a 6% to 6.5% return on their money if they bought it all cash. So again, you take those rents that we talked about earlier, that's a, that, that equals $6,307 a month. $75,684 a year, you don't use that total income. You go down to just the, uh, uh, you always take a vacancy factor. So you're only using 95% of that income, otherwise known as the effective income. And from that, you're comparing it against its actual expenses. Now expenses, as I've talked about in previous videos, consist of actual utilities, a uh, management fee. In this case, we're using 5%. And this is regardless if you're gonna manage it yourself or not because this is how a bank's gonna look at it. You're gonna always look at your new taxes. So again, you'll see here, if you look very closely, the ad valorem rate, which you could pull from public records, the current bonds, and then a proposed insurance. So roughly speaking, um, I came up with roughly 36.16% of the effective income as the expenses. So, so long as you're within a 30 to 40% margin uh, or, or, or percentage of the effective income, Towards expenses, then you know you're right on the right track. Sometimes you'll see performers that are only advertising at 22 or 25 percent. A lot of times, that's what you know you call fluffing, right? It'll make what's the, the property. What's the typical? What's the average that you see? 32 to 35 percent. Yeah, that sounds yeah. about right. Yeah, it depends on the Better age of the building. Yeah, yeah. So, so you sometimes you'll see again either it's too low or it's too high. Then you know something is wrong. Either the management is terrible and they're just like juicing the owner for every little nook and cranny they can get out or the agent is making the property look like it just runs like clockwork nothing ever breaks and you're gonna have this great return so again when you apply a 36.16 uh, expense ratio or opex against the effective income what you get is three thousand eight hundred twenty four dollars and ninety five cents a month that annualizes to forty five thousand eight hundred ninety nine dollars a year 
right? And again, this is before making a principal and interest payment, otherwise known as debt service. So you apply $45,899 a year to a $749,000 asking price and you get a 6.13% return, right? Now, that's, that's a good sign right there that you're on the right track. Then you'll, of course, you also take into consideration what are the market rents for this? In other words, if I raised all the rents to what they should be, then they should be uh, closer to like an average of like 2100 to 1650 Again, I start to increase the rent from a 6307 to $6,600 a month. That small little difference of 4.439, which is your loss to lease, that single value right there increases your cap rate from 6.13 to 6.55. Now, what does this mean with respect to market cap? Well, if people are on the average buying at a 6% return and you're slightly higher than that, then you know that the property is going to be worth more than what you're actually buying it for. And as you slowly raise your rents and increase your cap rate, but people are still willing to buy at a lower cap rate, then you increase your value again. The quick net effect of that is if you go to 0 0.6, a simple 4.43% increase in rent raises your value from 749000 to as much as $817,730.68. That's what the market would bear as a result of higher rents. All right. Again, you take that and we'll go to slide two. Now, and now, real quick, why would a person looking to buy an investment property want to buy in Richmond, a city that has rent control compared to a different city that doesn't have rent control like St. Pavel? Very, very good question. So, it really depends on the property. When you're approaching Richmond that does have rent control, and this applies for um, Oakland or San Francisco, you want to approach with a, an additional level of, of caution, primarily because you want to look at the attrition rate of the tenants. Does it look like they're going to be in there for the next 20 years, right? Or is the, the tenant base something that's going to be moving out within two years or three years as a result of buying a home? You also want to look at what the market rent, what the actual rents are on the place, right? Because there are some places in Richmond where the mark, the actual rents are so low where you're going to want to not buy there. It just so happens in this particular instance, the rents are close enough to market where it actually is justifying the price, right? Because you'll see that a lot of times agents will just look at what the last property sold for, use that as a comparable solely on its purchase price, irrespective of what its net operating income is, which is a result of the actual income that it generates, right? So if you've got lower income, then the value of the property should be less. And so that's why in like the previous episode, there was another fourplex at a similar price point, but the rents were lower, probably because the tenants had been there for a long time. And so because of those rents being lower, it was like a like a very low three cap, right? And, and so it was an immediate negative return. Yeah, when you did the analysis, I think you said it was worth like 363 Right. 390, it was for sure under 400,000. Yeah. So in order to actually make a 6% return, I would have to buy that property for 363,000 is what the net effect is, right? So now you take that cap rate and then you apply, or you take that, uh, the cap rate, you which are, and the net operating income before debt service and you apply, well, what if I had debt service? Because again, chances are you're not gonna buy this property cash. So as a smart investor, you're or something that you're not going to live in and you couldn't qualify as an owner occupant financing, you're going to typically look at putting 25% down. So if you put 25% down and you finance 75% of the value at a, at a, at a interest rate of say 4.8, what you get is a monthly payment or principal and interest payment. And you'll see this in point two of $2,947.31. That's your principal and interest payment. The number above that is just the interest only portion of that payment, $2,247. So when you look at the, the difference between $3,824 a month and a mortgage payment of $2,947, you get a cash flow of $877.65. You annualize that number over, uh, it, it, it turns into $10,531. And again, remember earlier we talked about how much money you would need to acquire this. And I said $206,000 approximately. So if you have an income of $10,531 a year over a $206,000, that's a 5.11% ROI or cash on cash. 
And so if your money or 206,000 was sitting in the bank, would it be earning 5.11% interest rate? Quick answer, no. Now, mutual fund, quick answer, no, right? Then, so that's your cash on cash. But it goes a little bit further because you got to remember there's principal reduction and principal reduction is actually income also because you're paying your mortgage balance down and creating an equity between its value and what you owe so when you apply the delta in this case about 200 dollars which is between 29.47 and 22.47 which is your interest only payment that $200 annualizes to additional income. So your $10,531 a year is really $18,935 a year or a 9.19% ROI. So again, you're, if you're earning $18,935 on your $206,000, which is what your down payment and closing cost were minus any credits for security deposit and whatnot, um, you're making 9.19% on your money. Again, would you do that in the bank or a mutual fund? Quick answer, no. And again, here's the beauty of real estate is that in any other investment vehicle, you don't have depreciation. So if you had, if you sold stock and you made a profit, you'd have to pay media tax on it. Well, here you can clearly see a profit of 18,935. And you see a little negative number there, 21,789. That's your depreciation. Quick story, you take 80% of the val of your cost basis, that's the value of the, of the actual improvement or the building. The land, which is roughly 20%, you can't depreciate. You take that 80% figure, you divide that over a 27 and a half year period for residential, and you get $21,789 that you can apply as depreciation against the 18,935 of taxable income. And so what you have is a negative 2853 on paper. So you don't pay tax on the $18,000. But as you raise those rents and you begin to climb from uh, $18,935 to $22,000 a year, thereby increasing your 9.19 ROI to 10.73, again, because now you're earning $22,099.84 on your $206,000 down and closing acquisition, you still have that $21,789 a year of depreciation for the next 27 and a half years to apply. And so you're roughly getting taxed on $310.75. So the final question is, is it a buy or is it a pass? It's a buy. Perfect. So thank you for watching another episode of Keeping It Realty. Go back and uh, subscribe. Subscribe on iTunes, Facebook, uh, any other channel that you listen to podcasts. We're also on iHeartRadio and Spotify. Uh, and then, uh, you know, for the people wondering why I also have a Star Wars uh, T-shirt on, I'm a huge Star Wars fan. And guess well, why what? didn't you tell me? I could I could have worn mine. We could have yeah. coordinated. And guess what? Today marks one year that the final season, final episode of Star Wars Rebels, the TV show, ended. Oh, and, really? Yes. And everyone online is sharing their best moments. And the best moment was final episode where the ending of Darth Maul. And Obi Wan Kenobi, their battle ends. Oh my! You know, you know what's crazy? I actually ran into one of the writers of that show on a plane on a Southwest airline on my way to Comic Con, San Diego Comic Con. For Rebels. For Rebels, yeah. So we became Facebook friends, and I try to pull out you know information ahead of time, but he's always really tight lipped. But yeah, I, yeah, I love that show. It's a great show. Yeah. So again, thank you so much for listening to the podcast. Thank you to our producer Sam Lemon. Please subscribe, like, comment, and share the podcast. Remember, you can listen to the podcast on iTunes, Podbean, iHeartRadio, Google Play, SoundCloud, and anywhere else you listen to podcasts. For more information on my business as a property manager and real estate team, go visit my website at markguzman.com. I really, really want to thank all of you for listening. It means the world to me, and I hope today's episode provides you value in your day-to-day -day life. I created this podcast to help showcase the many great people that live in this world and help share some knowledge that I've learned along the way in life. Again, thank you for listening. Check out our sponsors and I'll catch you on the next episode.